Why are we doing this in the last day? Because I wanted to totally throw you off. <laughs> this presentation is last completely day. affected now. Yeah. You're welcome. He, he's so, like, um, what's the word? Rattled. Yeah. You're, you're so rattled. That's my goal. Because I'm pretty sure, just kidding, I used to go after you. I think you I used to go after you. But. You know, that is a good way of like, speech class. Like, try to rattle people and see what, they, what would happen to them. Mm -hmm. Like, teach them that, you know, not everything could be perfect. That's what we did for our honors class this semester. Oh. For the freshmen. Because they were supposed to, they are supposed to create an argument that they well, shouldn't no. be at college right well, now. Just, just, just <laughs> Which, like, I mean, is pretty hard for them to do because they obviously yeah. well, have reasons why they want to be at college right eight, now. Yeah, so. Uh, and I just have like part of the Yeah, pretty much. I wish, yeah. oh, but then like us as yeah. like as mentors just but, like totally just like threw questions at them like that couldn't so, answer. So, so just didn't really talk. We didn't show that we don't care what you say, we just so want to get a question. Yeah, for the question you don't be more. Huh? Uh, Landon goes, then me, and no, no, no. I think it's you. I don't know, your presentation could be better than that. Uh, oh, and I know it could be. Uh, it's electron transfer. Oh, number five. Landon goes first, but I guess what's that one thing in my bill's um, like, I'm just smiling and thinking about it. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Just give some eye candy for the Capri. Uh, 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 so, yeah. it's different. It's hard to explain. I have a new one. It's just completely based on the bottom line. I should be able to cross this bottom line. I'll be able to kind of do it. Okay. Five yeah. minutes. <laughs> Do we miss anyone? One of the one that goes. One. Oh, really? No, we miss Andrew. Yeah. Andrew also does that. It just takes forever. It's just like one of those. So we miss just two, right? It looks like it. Okay, so before we start, uh, I suggest we do a little of um, social activity. <laughs> <laughs> you, you remember the uh, booklets from previous years. So for good memories, they do have photos of uh, participants. So if you don't mind, I suggest we all line up here and maybe just this video camera would be sufficient. But if someone wants to take a cell uh, photo, it is also fine. So it will be... It will go to the final release of the of the stuff. Yes. And I have forgotten, forgotten to remind you. I was thinking of like an actual suit, but I was like, yeah. Yeah, no kidding. I remember my friends. I would. And all, all visitors are also invited. To, Oh, you're gonna lay down on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Just go like all lay up. <laughs> There's not too many of us this year. Yeah, okay. ah, that's fine. Well, since it is a moving picture, uh, I can just move the camera from the left to the right. Where are we not? Even out. No, that's you right now. Uh, well, the only problem, like the guys the now on the left, they all have yellow yeah. faces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With some words on their faces, maybe you can the can the uh, presentation. Oh, yeah. Is it possible to get that? Is it possible to, get it possible to video mute and vi then unmute? Yeah. Yes. Can you do it for a second? Mm -hmm. And you guys are beautiful. <laughs> I don't know. If it is not easy, it's more important than that. <coughs> <coughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. North Dakotans. What are you expecting? Are no, 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 no. It's Canadian. I want to make all projectors dark. Oh, the camera? Dark. No. Okay. Make projections dark for 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can try to find your question. There we go. There. Okay. So, smile a couple of times <laughs> and uh, you can go from the left to the right for better focus and maybe. If it will not sufficient I don't know where it was. Yeah. Yeah. That's my. Oh! Come in, come in. You were in the picture. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. The picture. What? Should I be grabbing this or something? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Whatever you want. Nice. I'm perfect. Can we do oh, okay. <laughs> now let's, let's cover it. Okay, okay. The whole. Keep on drinking. Okay. It's hard to tell. And where is London? <laughs> Keep going. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I suggest we, we all oh, no, <laughs> go back to the seats and start uh, the go. actual. Uh, so was it, was the photo taken? Yes. Yeah. 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 Sort of, kind of. Angela, can you turn uh, projectors so on the live back? action is quite panoramic. Oh, I don't know if this is the Oh, okay. That's the yeah. Oh, wait, I just dropped my phone. Yeah. Beth is trying to rattle everyone on their very last presentation. <laughs> Figures after you try to rattle her on her last presentation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, hey, hey, watch out. Watch out. Have some nice questions. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> As you probably <laughs> realize, our main goal for today is to fit the schedule. <laughs> so that uh, those of you who uh, need to go to other classes do not, do not suffer. So this is the last meeting in the uh, in work in physical chemistry three four three six four. So here is the list of uh, subjects in class, and if we do not go into much details, some of you may go into teaching, some of you may go to, into industries, industry, some of you may go into academia. And <laughs> academic experience is a positive thing for everyone. And the activities in academia consist of three things. So theoretical background, practical skills, and scientific communications. So today we will test all three, especially the last one. Scientific communication. So you have uh, written, made the research projects with selecting the subject, uh, written the reports upon completion of the project, and now it will be very brief presentation. So, <coughs> how do we arrange the schedule? Uh, please try, if, if you look into the schedule, you see that there is a six minutes assignment per person, per presenter. So they are split approximately this way. Three minutes for presentation. If you go over, I'll become nervous and try to keep you from the stage. Two, three minutes for questions. And zero to one minute to walk in there and back. Um, sometimes questions may take longer. The uh, presentations are one of two main components towards uh, productivity in the class. So if you convert it into points, 300 points for presentations and 500 points for answering questions, if any. Uh, the Presentations are arranged in three groups. Well, sorry to the first three. <laughs> Their faces are blocked. Um, but they are there. You can see it on the, on the printout. So first group, approximately up to there, up to number five, deal with performance of electronic degrees of freedom in different chemical systems. Then about <coughs> four, uh, three, four presentations go into mixed performance processes 
in chemical systems when both electronic and nuclear degree of freedom uh, are important. And the uh, presentations at the uh, last but not least section of the screen dealing with chemical reactions were primarily interatomic distances are changing and their quantum properties may affect the outcome of chemical reaction. So, uh, this, oh no, there is a little protocol. So, all of your presentations are uploaded to uh, this computer. They are numbered according to the way you and the names include first and last name of the presenter. So what you do if you see uh, Windows PC for the first time, <laughs> you navigate to your number name, click, see its uh, opening, and you click on this little symbol for starting the presentation. And after you finish, you may close it by a little diagonal cross on the upper right. Just in case, you will most, most likely know it. So with this, I would like to... Um, the little pieces of paper have program on one side and uh, feedback on the other. So if you are part of the class, feel free to uh, do feedback optionally. If you are uh, guests, <coughs> uh, feedback is your main interest. And th then I will collect. So with this, I would like to invite to the stage uh, Mark Emily who will tell on the, about electron and electric field. Right, so uh, my presentation is an electron in an electric field uh, with uh, electrochemistry with arbitrary uh, molecules. <laughs> You can use it, yes. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> uh, so these are some important variables that I used. Uh, X var is uh, the width of the electron wave packet. Uh, the mass, uh, these are all in atomic units. The mass is just one. Uh, the initial position is just where I started it. In. Uh, so wave packet, uh, this is basically a copy and paste from an earlier presentation I gave just to make sure uh, y'all know what, uh, how the MATLAB program models the electron. Uh, the square root of dx essentially <laughs> defines the one-dimensional space this is taking place in. Uh, and then the next part is the plane wave, uh, how it actually propagates the gap. And then the next part is the Gaussian. It defines the shape of the electron. Uh, and then the final part is normalization, <coughs> making sure that the area under the electron is equal to one. Um, and then so uh, other important parts I included uh, how I actually modeled the electric field and uh, atoms, <clears throat> molecules, I mean. Um, so, uh, uh, it just said zeros for one part, and then <coughs> this part has a, this part of the space has a value of one, this part of the space has a value of zero, and so on. Uh, these are very generalized. Uh, and then so, then what I did is I uh, increased the slope of the electric field each time. So uh, this first run I did was uh, no electrical field. Uh, and, oh, they are not running. Um, Describe the words. You don't have okay. time to fix. The electric field just basically, uh, well, it just expanded into the electron and some of it, I mean, into the molecule. And then some of it happened <coughs> to 
pass over onto the right side of the screen um, into the second molecule. Uh, and then so uh, this one actually has a YouTube link. So if you really want to see it, you can go check that out. Uh, and that basically did the same thing. However, some of it moved to the right more and more. And then so as I increased the slope, it got faster and faster. However, the movies aren't working, which was the main point of the, you know, these slides. And then uh, this one, basically, it all ended up moving over towards the right. And actually, maybe in the last one as well, it overcame the second molecule and just continued on moving into space. However, the simulation uh, it stopped at the edge because the MATLAB system would have it come back on the other side if it weren't for my electrical field acting as a sort of barrier from that. And so, uh, in summary, increasing the electric field increases the rate at which the electron propagates. And if the electron field is too powerful, it'll escape and go to the side. Uh, this was just sort of a general uh, example of how an electric field <coughs> affects an electron can be applied to a variety of situations. OK, let's thank Mark. <laughs> and uh, just in case uh, you may test uh, your videos by clicking on it, uh, try it. If it not work, we are uh, limited in time. We should go for questions. Well, I was just going to add on to that. Sometimes it's easier to exit out of the presentation and then start the video. You may try it uh, if you do not go over three minutes. OK, <coughs> questions to Mark? Uh, you did, please. So in the electric field, you talked about the strength, which was uh, implemented through the slope, right? Yes. Uh, so means you're moving towards the, right, uh, to the, towards the right, it's increasing the yeah. electric field. But electric field has a direction, right? Um, yes. Right. So you, you, you have in whole this direction being which way? Uh, <clears throat> uh, electrons move electric against field. the field. If I recall correctly, electric fields push positively charged in their direction. Mm -hmm. So this would represent an electric field moving the opposite direction of the way that the electron moved. So right or left, like according uh, to your figure? The electron, the, elec uh, the electric field go to would have been going to the left. So the electrons move towards, towards us, to, to, towards the increased field, right? Yeah. If you will show the movies, and we will see how your wave packet is going to the right from the against the field well, and end up in the right side of the uh, of your screen, right? Yeah. Okay. And well, it would also work with uh, <clears throat> positrons as well, theoretically, because I, in the code the direction wasn't specified. So uh, if the electric field's facing one. Uh, an opposite electric field would move. Okay, so it means it was not involved in the code, right? So yes. you're just assuming that because they move, like you, you just uh, inserted the direction, and this <coughs> direction was kind of uh, either against, or you can say along the field if you change in the charge, if it would be not electron but a positively charged particle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's thank Mark <laughs> for presenting and answering questions. And now next presenter is. Marvin Schneider, uh, who will continue the subject of electric field in more chemical uh, reality in application to um, electrochemistry. Uh, so I did the electric field as applied to anthroquinone. I chose anthroquinone as it has many other applications, including photosynthesis and redox reactions. <laughs> Meaning 
because it's a carbon-based molecule, I can use a carbon-based electrode and the weight packet should be able to transfer over it. So I modeled the electric field to see the strength of the electric field needed to make the transfer. And if this works, this is a video of what I actually saw. Goes on for a while, so I'm gonna let it stop there. The two methods I used were two different methods to, cal to calculate the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> And then these are the results I was able to obtain. And this was at an electric field strength of 0.01 AU, which you cannot see because it's behind the video. But the data one and data two, so the blue line and the red line represent the two different methods. And the yellow line is a linear slope to determine the rate that was obtained. P1 being the rate, and in this case, five times 10 to the negative fourth, with approximately a 20% transfer. And increasing it to 0.03 AU, the rate increases, and so does the transfer. Increasing it to 0.06, the rate decreased a little bit, but the transfer still increased. And at 0.09, the rate is its slowest, but the probability of transfer is at 80%. So in conclusion, at an electric field strength of 0.03 AU, the rate is the fastest, with the transfer at roughly 50%. And at 0.06, the rate is slightly slower with the transfer of roughly 75%. So depending on what you're doing and how long you want to wait for it to fully transfer, the higher strength of electric field gets you a higher transfer, but you're going to be waiting longer. That's okay, well, thanks, Megan. <laughs> so any questions? Yes, please. So similar to what Mark just presented, uh, it, did you like uh, test at all if you just did like <coughs> an obscene number and would like an electron kick off at all or anything like that? Or what would happen if your variable change was too high? I didn't test higher above, than above 0.09. That's kind of where I cut it off once the rate started to decrease again. OK. So you mentioned two methods for calculating your Hamiltonian. What exactly is the principal differences between these methods? Physically. The differences between them are the two different equations put into the code, but when they both come out, they come out. Uh, no, no, no. The What's the difference result? in these equations? <laughs> Why is it different? What, what exactly? Which terms are different? What makes them different? I don't actually know off the top of my head. Well, you're using two methods and you don't know what's the difference between two methods? Can you show a question where, when you present the methods? What? Can you show the equation? Yeah. So, what is different? Which uh, method do you show with this equation? And what would be, would be different if uh, you use another one? So the top equation is our standard Hamiltonian, and the bottom equation involves the continuation. So you define here your momentum, or momentum squared. Mm -hmm. Is it always defined this way, or you have different ways to define momentum operator? There are different definitions in the code of the momentum operator. So they're different in the way how you define the momentum operator, right? And in one case, you apply. So you, one is like matrix approach. So you have a kind of discrete set of momentum. In the other way, it's more like a differential way. Both are discrete, but different number of nearest neighbors are taken into account. So I was helping. Thank you. <laughs> um, there is one minute more for questions. I have one. So, uh, in Mark's presentation, the larger the slope, the stronger the voltage between electrodes. And in your movie, the slope is changing. How do you interpret it, or what, what are you trying to model? The slope changes in the video due to cyclic photometry rather than Mark's standard linear photometry. Cyclic photometry involves overcoming the potential. So as the system overcomes the potential, it decides to return in reverse back to the normal values. OK. But thank you, Megan.
And the next presentation is by Jan Berg, who will uh, tell a story about interface of two semiconductors and um, the impact of the interface of two semiconductors onto modern technology. <laughs> Uh, so I get to talk about uh, semiconductors and their uses in transistors. So uh, transistors, they're in your phones, they're in pretty much every electronic device ever. Um, and they're basically brought to life by the use of these semiconductors. So um, basically what a semiconductor is, um, it's two different, uh, or it's, a, it's an element that has some movable electrons in it, so, but not completely like metal. Um, and a transistor uh, involves a PN junction, is kind of like the, the heart and soul of the on and off switch for the transistor. So uh, there's a P-type and there's an N-type, and they're generally made out of silicon. Um, and you can, um, basically you can dope these with different, um, with different doping atoms, like the N-type, you would dope it with phosphorus, because it's about the same and it has an extra electron. And the P-type, you dope it with um, like boron. <laughs> So it actually takes an electron out, so it creates a hole. Um, so this is basically what, or that's um, that's what makes like the light switch uh, the transistors. So uh, this image is basically uh, telling us how how a transistor kind of works. So uh, basically, on the boundary between the two different semiconductors, um, your n doped, so your negatively doped. Um, your negatively doped semiconductor has an excess of electrons in it, and your positively doped has a lack of electrons in it. So it's got a bunch of holes. So at this barrier, this there's a certain distance um, where these electrons are going to disperse over and fill the holes in the positively doped semiconductor. So in this area right here, this is called the... Um, it's called the depletion zone. So uh, this is actually depleted of movable electrons and movable holes. So um, when these electrons move over here, it actually creates a negative boundary on this part and a positive boundary on this part. So it creates an electric field. Um, and then so this would be what, like a graph of like voltage and the electric field and what the, uh, the charge has to encounter when, um, when you're trying to pass a current through it. So, uh, this is uh, an image I pulled off of YouTube, but it's basically just illustrating the, the positive side and the negative side of the interface. Um, so the next slide right here, uh, it's gonna, this is basically talking about the strength of the depletion zone on the interface. So uh, it basically relies on two different things. It relies on the voltage applied to the um, to the outside of the transistor, so that uh, what the voltage does is it decreases the size of this depletion zone by this equation, or the potential difference of the current itself. So basically, it's like the kinetic energy of um, <coughs> how much current you're pushing through it to basically push your electrons past this negative barrier through the transistor. Okay. So, um, yeah, so basically the one that I tested was um, just increasing the kinetic energy, increasing the momentum of your electrons going through your barrier as opposed to the voltage um, decreasing the depletion zone. So uh, basically kind of what it has to get over is this is like your, your n-type, and what that image is showing is kind of like confined within the n-type as long as, or as long as you have a lesser amount of kinetic energy. So, uh, what was Most. I'm not pressing Most. the buttons. There we go. So, basically what this one is showing is that um, I have my kinetic energy, I have my momentum set at uh, negative 0.5 right now. So it's not very energetic pushing through the transistor, so it stops right at this barrier. Right here. 
So it's confined to your one type of semiconductor. Uh, and then this one, I've bumped it up to negative um, 1.5. So the energy level is actually above the potential difference of your, um, of your field at the interface. So this one just flows right through and it's got an open current moving through the transistor. So. Okay, well, thank you. I see a question. You said a semiconductor is a material in which the electrons are free to move, but it's not a metal. What's it's, the difference between a metal and a semiconductor? Well, a metal, the, um, the electrons within a metal are moving freely uh, within the network, within the substance, right? Um, but a semiconductor has the opportunity to move electrons throughout it, but it's not extremely free like a metal. It's um, you need to put in energy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, like this one, we uh, doped it with like phosphorus, which introduced extra electrons. So then it has a limited ability to conduct electricity with those extra electrons. Then almost right. <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of energy, band diagrams is a very simple explanation of what is it. A band diagram? Say, band, say yes. Band. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, time, time is up for, for Jan. Let's well, thank him for standing the questions. So, and the next presentation is by Vanden Johnson, who will continue and probably finish the story of pure electronic degrees of freedom, and he will also tell about interface, about two different materials, but uh, from slightly different aspects. Um, so I did uh, my project on simulating the effects of interfacial bonding on electron hole recombination rates in uh, late halide perovskite based solar cells. Um, so the basics of how a solar cell work is you shine your light down on it and the, the normally it's just a, an n-doped silicon wafer and a p-doped silicon wafer. So the, the p-doped one, when, it, when the light strikes an electron, it will uh, it'll excite the electron up into the conduction band through this band gap. That's what makes it a semiconductor, I guess, is that there's a small gap here. Um, <clears throat> so once the electron is promoted to the conduction band, it's no longer bound to any particular atom, so then it can move around freely. And at that point, it can move into the n-type silicon and push current through whatever circuit you connect to your solar cell. Um, if an electron and a hole meet, though, then they're going to recombine, and you're not going to end up getting any current out of there. So that is something that needs to be considered when you're designing solar cells. Um, uh, this is basically a schematic of the, uh, the solar cells that I was trying to produce. Um, I did finally get one of them to work out this way. Uh, I guess this isn't really terribly important to what I'm talking about right now. Um, okay, so these are both the through space model and these are the through bond model. And uh, basically the difference is between the perovskite and the dye. There's a, they're either connected through space or they're connected through a methoxy linker group. That's what this little well is right here. And of course, that figure is blocked. Uh, so basically, that would just correspond to there actually being a connection right here on this diagram. Can, can you explain what are those uh, things that are connected or not connected? Uh, this is a, a lead halide perovskite. Actually, this might be a picture of a cesium perovskite. Just a perovskite, either way. And this is the spiral that die. Um, so then, at low momentum, when you start with the electron over here and try to send it across the barrier. Uh, you'll see that most of it ends up reflecting back. You really get what's going on, guy. There we go. <laughs> um, so nothing really crosses its boundary. Um, and now I'm going to run these ones, I guess. <laughs> the one on the far left is off. Yeah, not that one. No, one more to the left. Off. Well, okay. all the way to the. One more left. Yeah, that one. 
Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, so if we start the electron with a higher moment. Okay, so if you started with a higher momentum, you can see the, the wave packet actually transfers through this boundary. Um, but an unfortunate side effect of the periodic boundary conditions that this simulation is running on is that you do have a significant amount of transfer happening across these boundaries, which is an unphysical artifact. And that needs to be accounted for when interpreting the uh, data. So uh, these are the graphs that describe the, the probability of finding the electron either in the dye or in the perovskite. Um, so this, the solid blue curve here is the one that we're interested in. This tells you the uh, probability of finding the electron in the perovskite. So basically, after all of this stuff here, I'm, you're getting a lot, of, uh, a lot of transfer happening through the periodic boundary conditions. So you don't necessarily want to be considering this data back here. So what we're looking at is just the, the initial, um, the early times when this is the, the only major transfer happening right there. Um, so you, uh, you zoom into these graphs, you just look at this section here and this section here, and you figure out the slope of this linear region to figure out the, the rate at which the electron is transferring into the perovskite. And you end up getting these transfer rates, which have um, unphysical temperatures, but you end up getting a very interesting <laughs> phenomenon where in the Arrhenius plot, you, it certainly doesn't obey the Arrhenius equation, because if it did, then the Arrhenius plot would appear to be linear. Instead, it appears that the, the transfer rate is just linear with, uh, it's directly proportional to the temperature of the system. And that is... Uh, Okay, let's end. Let me. Questions? Yeah. Oh, oh so <laughs> late. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Pardon was, was, was the first. What was that? Uh, so you mentioned that when, go back to the uh, slide two, three, where you're talking about the solar cell gap thing? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that when light gets absorbed by the P type semiconductor, the electron travels through the band gap. Yes. Can you explain what you mean by that? Um, okay, so the the light has energy in the form of photons, uh, where their energy is described by just the Planck's constant times their frequency. Mm -hmm. So if they have a high enough frequency or a low enough wavelength, then when they collide with an electron, they're going to impart that energy onto the electron. So as long as it's enough energy to actually get through this gap, because this is a, I guess the, the y-axis in this figure would represent energy. Um, so as long as the photon has more energy than this gap, it can actually promote the electron from the valence band to the conduction band. Okay. And probably you wanted to put the arrow up, not down. Yeah, yeah I was in a hurry and <laughs> made that squiggle the wrong way. But. So, but, uh, if it, so if it doesn't have enough energy, does it get stuck to the band gap? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, the band gap and it can't quite make it all the way? Uh, electrons actually can't occupy any states within this energy. Um, I forget, I guess, all the the minutia on how that works, but basically the electron would stay in the valence band and the... And no current. Right, yeah, you wouldn't get any current out of that for sure. Um, I want to say that the light would be scattered, but I'm not entirely confident in that. I would have to think about that some more. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't move through the band gas or thing. And, and we have three minutes for, for questions, there. just uh, so you can complete your question anyway. How are those barriers calculated? Uh, these ones? No, yeah. uh, these are files that were provided to me by Aaron Forty. He's done more thorough research in the same thing. So, uh, so in just parameters or like the, the barriers? What are green lines? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> and how they correlate with the pictures on the top? Uh, the green lines represent the potential energy. So if you look at it, there's basically the electrons are going to want to be attracted to these atomic structures, I guess. Um, so these are basically where the atoms are sitting in the perovskite, in one dimension at least. And these are the dye here. And then this, uh, this is just a little potential well, I guess, for the, uh, the methoxy linker group between the perovskite and the dye. And then uh, these lines up here are just the probability distribution of the electron. So last question, 
uh, where transfers quicker through bond and or through space? Uh, through bond. Okay, let's thank uh, London once again. And the next presentation is by Christian Nunes, who will continue description of the same chemical system, but from the very drastically different point of view. Thank you for the intro, uh, Dimitri. So, as you were saying, I am now uh, studying the same uh, type of rea uh, reaction, but through Marcus theory. To start off, Marcus theory was uh, first uh, conceived of by uh, Rudolf Marcus in 1958. And it was used for the to look at the electron transfer of inorganic, organic, metallics, and organic molecules. Here's just a, a general description of what a Marcus theory um, graph would look like. Um, we have two different potentials, which both would correlate to uh, a molecule. One would be an acceptor, and one would be a donor. And what we're looking at is this um, intersection by these dotted points that um, it will be like the activation barrier in like the graph, the common graph we'll see, except this is just the energy we're trying to overcome to transfer this electron from the acceptor to the donor. This um, gap, the HAB, or 2HAB, is um, it's called a, sorry, I remember the word. Um, but what it, what it means is the smaller this gap ha um, is, the less likely that the electron would be um, stick to the lower potential, but the uh, wider the gap we, this becomes, the easier it is for the lower potential electron to jump back to the higher potential. So the substrates, as we discussed before, are uh, a lead hy halide uh, perovskite and an organic dye, uh, organic dye of tribenzylamine. We had two different types of the dye. We had the unfunctionalized one, which was just the tribenzylamine. And then the functionalized one with the methanol group. Um, so these are just the substrates we're using. And then the very bottom here, we're showing what the type of scenarios we're going through of a through space interaction and a bond interaction between the uh, methanol group to the perovskite. Um, as you see that the perovskite is donating to, uh, will be ex uh, donating a proton to the dye while the um, the electrons go into the perovskite. That's for the hole. Hole. Okay. Um, so the parameters uh, for this, um, we're looking at uh, mainly at the bond uh, lengths, or I shouldn't call it bond length, but the distance between the, the perovskite and the dye. And for the chemical bond, it would be 0 0.64 angstroms, while the through space length is 0 0.24 uh, angstroms. And as um, for the experiment, I started at a um, momentum of 50 just to see um, where, um, where to start. But I jumped up to 90 because that is where, the, uh, where I decided the best optimal uh, electron transfer starts. And I incrementally uh, increased by 10 to 130. So here's the chemical bond scenario. Um, I simplified the Marcus theory Due to, um, due to his more real learning experience. So I set both the energy potentials to zero, so the, um, there is no offset. And I also made both the curvatures um, the same for each one. So this is not uh, the true scenario between the two. The only thing that's mainly true to it is the length between the dye and the perovskite. Um, so as we are looking at the initial momentum of 100, which is on the optimal yield I saw of the electrons transferred. Um, this um, uh, moving part is the electron. Um, and as you can see, every time it passes its intersection point, there is enough energy to transfer over some of the electrons into the acceptor. And as over time, you will see this will increase. Um, so then we, would, um, we also moved on to the through space. There is a smaller gap between the dye and the perovskite, so there will be a lower activation due to the intersection point will be lower down on the uh, energy uh, potential. So as you can see, we start having a faster churn of uh, electrons transfer. 
So the, to determine the yield, we did transmission probability, and here's a graph of that. That is just taking the integration from the uh, intersection point to the left and right. The left will be the product and the right will be the reactant. And I decided to take the yield uh, right around the three point. Um, and as you can see over time, the, we have an increase in yield, meaning the electron transfer has, was uh, being achieved over time. Here's just a larger uh, rate of scenarios. I, um, in this, you will also see the rate of the reaction. And from, a, from what I see, uh, this is the chemical bond and this is the through space. And you see that the rate of the reaction at 50 does not achieve, but in the through space, uh, in the momentum of 50 is enough to start transferring the electron over. It's, um, with also a higher rate, but it decreases um, as you um, increase the rate. So we also are looking at how the sh uh, electron sh uh, shell uh, shifts, because every time you move the electron over, the, it would shift over time. <coughs> at the momentum of 50, you will see, um, because there's no electron transfer, the shell never shifts. While when we, I increase it to 130, over time, due to more electrons moving over, you will start seeing a shift over time. And here's just the plots of the rate versus uh, kinetic energy. And as, as you increase, we'll see a, a quick increase in reaction rate through the through space, which is the circles, and the, these di uh, triangles are the chemical, um, the chemical bond. And you can see a faster rate of increase, and the chemical bond is just faster overall through the whole scenario. So in, uh, in conclusion, the chemical bond has a fa faster reaction rate than the through space, um, but the through space has a quicker reaction rate um, increase. Higher reaction yields are, um, yield further electron shifts, and there's a point in which the yields start to decrease because the momentum overpowers and the electrons are able to jump back and forth between the donor and the acceptor. Um, we are not looking, we're looking at a very simplified version of this scenario um, due to just a learning experiment. Okay, let's thank uh, Christian. <laughs> Although we are a little over the time, but uh, are there any active questions? Okay. Just for clarification, if you go two slides before where you're showing this kind of step like uh, functions, previous. I mean, oh, sorry. Before. I heard you. And another one. Huh? Yeah. One more. Oh, sorry. That. Keep going. And another. Keep going. And another. Here. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, could you clarify again? You said something about product and reactant, but what is a product in your case? What is a reactant? Product when uh, yes. transferred, or could you the, So, the product, the product in this case is not a new material being formed. Is the product is um, the electron being captured in the acceptor. Um, so these these are the electrons starting in the uh, the electron donor, and at, over time, as more of these electrons start in the donor um, goes to the acceptor, this will decrease while these will increase over time because um, we're looking at um, the electrons getting being transferred in the acceptor. Okay, and and the step like shape of this function is due to just because you are taking um, your it's the due the the electron. Uh, so as you saw in the video, so we the this electron moves to the right first, and do and so there won't be any transfer because it's not crossing its intersection point. Mm -hmm. So as it comes back, um, because it's oh, being reflected off the barrier, it's kind of reflecting the uh, size of your yes, uh, well. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. These are barriers, so it will be reflected off that barrier back towards the intersection point. We had it moving to the right first, so that's why you see these. Um, Good. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, and if there is no time for questions, write down your questions uh, in the space provided, so quickly. Why, I, I may have missed this, why is the through space lower barrier than the through top in this system? Uh, the, the barrier isn't uh, lower, it's, so due to the curvatures, and we have a smaller gap, um, these curvatures end up having, um, meeting at a uh, lower point than at, um, that's the chemical bond. So as you see here. Yeah, yeah, I, I was asking why. 
Why is it, why is it like it's fine to, to answer, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, it's, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> because they, they are further away and they interact better. <laughs> okay. okay, let's uh, thank Christian once again. So, uh, next presenter is Austin Brewer, and she will continue presentations based on the same um, approach, same methodology, but he will apply it to different type of uh, chemical system. <laughs> all right, yeah, I'm Austin. Uh, you know, I, I have a good background water. We're all chemists, apparently, that's important to us. So, you know, I'm pretty theatrical in this. But I really focused on the effects of initial momentum in the system that uh, Christian was dealing with. And Christian looked at a lot of that through space, as well as the bonds, and I specifically focused mainly on the bonds. I'm looking at a manganese uh, semiconductor for ma or quantum dots on that level. So I'll walk through quickly what, what we found out. So just quick background on quantum dots and why this is actually interesting research. Quantum dots are uh, essentially semiconductors that are used to uh, initiate different transitions in the phase of you know, what's actually being emitted by something that is emitting light. So this has really big uh, implications in nanotechnology, uh, different kind of photovoltaics as we've seen in, uh, in solar cells and everything like that. But that's just a quick background on them. And Christian also had a great background on what Marcus theory actually is. The only things I wanted to point out was the actual equation set up by Marcus. Um, and what that includes is a lot of different uh, variables. But the variable that I'm interested in most is really that energy barrier, that energy gap, and what's going to create the ideal situation for any kind of uh, semiconductor, in this case, our manganese one. So the hypothesis of my research and what I focus my research on is, again, finding that uh, optimal kind of initial momentum where we're going to see as much electron transfer as we possibly can. Uh, and I'll get into the details of that once we actually come to um, the data with that as well. So just to first of all see what these look like here. I can play both at the same time. It'd be awesome. So I two optimal ones that I like to show for comparison is starting at an initial momentum of 35 atomic units and then also 100 atomic units. As you can see, the 35 atomic units is having trouble actually crossing this barrier and actually transferring electrons over to this manganese acceptor. Now, the one at 100 atomic units is having no problem actually crossing this barrier. So electrons are being transferred between these, this manganese and bromine bond that's in this complex that was on the previous page. And sorry, I can explain that later if you have any questions on it. Um, what this means really is that as we kind of see this trend continue on, and as we see it with some uh, data here, I'll, I'll come back to that slide actually, but with the computational data, as we increase momentum, we're seeing a trend with all of these uh, different outcomes. So the first outcome of kinetic energy is obviously we're seeing more kinetic energy in this bond system. And with that, we're seeing more electron transfer. So as you can see, and I'll conclude too, that the optimal range here we're seeing is about between 65 and 100 uh, initial momentum, where we're getting the most of our electron transfer in that semiconductor system. What we're seeing too is as we increase uh, the as we increase the initial momentum too, we're seeing a higher rate of reaction or those electron transfers actually occurring. So this is just some visualized data. It's again with that uh, uh, time the same time period or I'm sorry the same uh, initial momentums as before. We're seeing in the first one there's no electron transfer that's really occurring. Uh, there is some, but it's just back and forth. And then this last one down here. There's this back and forth that's continuously occurring, and we see the optimal kind of points that it's getting to. Uh, the rest kind of is what Christian already talked about. We're seeing not as much shift in uh, the reaction coordinate or electron transfer, and yeah, those, those kind of go along with the trends that I already talked about. So in conclusion, uh, what the research kind of showed is that there was kind of an ideal initial momentum between 65 and 100 atomic units. Um, there's definitely a non-ideal initial momentum, uh, which is interesting as well, ones that obviously don't make electron transfer shifts. And just focusing on what the future of the research can bring, looking at changes out of space with this uh, example, or even through um, things like temperature change and everything like that would be something to pursue in the future. 
Okay, I think uh, Ocean. Good questions. Not good questions, please. So physically, how you interpret this uh, different momentums? Like, what exactly is the physical uh, origin of for these parameters? Yeah. So if I'm answering this correctly, what I under what I understand as the physical changes that are actually happening is that as I increase the momentum of the system. Uh, there's more electron transfers from the bromine in this kind of octahedral uh, environment switching over to the manganese, which just creates what I would interpret as a more stable quantum dot, but I guess that could be up for interpretation, if that answers your question. Well, it's kind of from, it's not exactly the question which I ask, but thank you. I mean, this is also an interesting point which you mentioned. No, my question is just in general, like when you say it has to be an optimal kinetic uh, energy mm -hmm. right, for, for this or that electron. It, but is it coming due to the heating, to the just like to temperature, or what exactly making this uh, optimal momentum? Yes, yeah, for sure. From my understanding of it, it would be the heating. And when we see in photo uh, photovoltaics, for example, as we've seen, is that sunlight or energy from uh, wavelengths and everything like that is what's creating that initial momentum. Okay. So well, if does it deal with uh, because you have you have a metal center, right, and you also have organic molecules in a quantum dot. So yep. can this momentum be also associated with a difference which you might change if you can change some uh, ligands or if you change in, uh, the metal center from one material to another, you probably expect that this also might change the kind of binding energy of your electron and maybe changing the momentum as well. Yeah, right? absolutely. And so I think if chemical you... Chemical composition of material. Oh, absolutely. If you focused on a different, uh, you know, quantum dot, uh, for example, Christian is the perfect example. We did very similar coding, very similar processes, but he has a very different molecule or some kind of semiconductor that's getting far different results than what I'm getting. If you saw his kind of rate of reaction, it's very kind of stepwise, where mine, if you saw, was just kind of this continuous curve. So yeah, absolutely, chemical composition changes what's actually occurring in the quantum dot. How many lead atoms are replaced by manganese? All or one? One. Okay, let thank Austin. <laughs> so, the next presenter is Aaron Pavensky. So, he will continue the same approach for a different uh, chemical reaction. Yeah. So, my, uh, my research kind of approached the same kind of concept except where I was looking at. Wait, let me uh, <laughs> sorry, complete the introduction. When in, the opportun in this list of possible research uh, projects, this project was labeled by initials Dr. A.P. because the idea came from Dr. Alex Parham. And uh, Aaron Polanski recognized it as it is a prompt to use his initials, <laughs> which are also A.P. Good. Yeah, so I was, uh, this was a reaction between a metal hydroxide and a carbon chain to form, not a metal hydroxide, a carbonyl and a <laughs> carbon chain to form a hydroxide and a charged carbon. And so it was just to analyze to see the, due to the charged carbon being formed and with the hydroxide, the hydroxide is not entirely stable. And so to get as much of that produced as you can, I was analyzing the transfer of the hydrogen to, from the chain to form the hydroxide. And so that's what we did here. Or that's <coughs> what we did. So this is the coding that I used right away. So for my, oh, geez, where is it? All right, so for the mass, it is going to be that of just the single hydrogen that we're looking at for, because that's the only thing that's being transferred and moved around from the carbon chain to the metal. And then I changed, the peanut is what I changed at different points of the time. So I started at, I think I've had a 0.1 and I went all the way up to like 10 or something. And that's just the different energy levels that was used. And then, there's something else. Oh yeah. The width of them is the wavelengths converted into atomic units. One is for the um, hydroxyl group, and the other one is for the carbon chain. And then, I think that's all I'm going to talk about about this. Next, I have the actual data that was collected. Oh, you can't see it all, but that's OK. Um, what's really important is the temperatures, I guess you could say. So I started with the point 0.1 and I went all the way to 20 actually, 10 and 20 are at the bottom there. And so with the raw data, the slope is the production of the actual 
products. And as the temperature or as the energy was continually increased, the slope did continually increase. Um, what I found though is that this really did not, even though yes, it did yield more, some of the temperatures really aren't actually plausible. So I came to the conclusion that um, temperature like at 81 Kelvin, probably the most like realistic temperature that would actually make the reaction go at an increased rate. I mean, anything else, you could tone it in a little more and actually find a reasonable value for your energy level. But I mean, I don't think any of us are going to get to 32,000 Kelvin anytime soon. So, and then I have some videos of the peanut at one, or the energy at one, I should say. And so you can just see that as the reaction continues, it will slowly, <laughs> continually try to create the products. But then also at the same time, if you would like keep the energy level consistent, which it is, and you would run it for a longer period of time, it'll hit an equilibrium, and it'll just go back and forth and create and destroy the products and just keep going all the way. And then, oh. here's a peanut of tin. This one you actually saw a lot more product actually formed because of the higher energy level. I think you can start to see it getting into the um, equilibrium at the end though, but I really just ignored that and only just focus on the beginning part of the data because no time can you ever have a consistent energy of anything like that. So that is the graphs for those. Oh, is there any question? Okay, let's thank uh, Aaron. <laughs> and any questions? So can you remind what is the reaction? You didn't show yes. the... Yes, okay. so I was going to draw it, but I'm not good at drawing. So it's of a... Um, show by fingers. <laughs> so it's going to be of a metal carbonyl group, so a double bond and oxygen reacting with the carbon chain and taking a hydrogen from that carbon chain to produce a hydroxide. But then at the same time, a charged carbon is also going to be formed, and so it's really a reaction intermediate, and it would like react into something else. And so <laughs> I was only focusing on the hydroxyl group, mm -hmm. and so I only focused on that actual hydrogen transfer because I wanted to get that production rate as high as possible. Okay. One, two, three. Let's thank uh, everyone again. <laughs> you wanted to ask? Yeah, I guess. Okay, good. Sorry, Aaron. Uh, so could you go back to like your first plot? Slowly start preparing. This one? Yeah. Or no, just the oh, first one. one. Yeah. Okay, oh. so and then and then going back to the one you were just on, in comparison, those two graphs where you're seeing this kind of like position versus time. Yep. In the last one, it seems like there's a lot of static in between, you know, the actual This one? Uh, no, the last one actually. For oh, the last one. Yeah. If you see there's a lot of just kind of you know, I, I can't tell yeah. what's going on right in the middle. So what is that? What is, could, you, could you explain right that? Right in the middle, that was just like interference, I want to say, because like it's not an ideal reaction. And so, especially at this high of an energy level. And what might interference like include? Like the production of like other things besides the actual hydrogen transfer and stuff. So like at certain energy levels, it's just at a very higher energy level. And so, there's a lot more momentum of the actual graph going back and forth. And so it like interferes with itself kind of. So like cross the barrier and then it'll go back through and so it'll push more to the other side. And so it creates kind of, it just interferes with itself. Makes sense to me. So it is neither coherent state nor eigenstate. Therefore it is a mess. Okay, <laughs> okay let's thank Aaron for the third time. So the next presentation is by Braden Wake, who uh, starts new chapter. From now on, we will be talking about more intuitive aspects. So there will be only one potential energy surface, but it doesn't make it uh, less challenging. So there will be only one potential energy surface curve uh, for different situations. 
and brilliant we'll start with um, matching merging electric field and potential energy service. All right, so I guess I'm pretty interested in uh, modeling something similar to the like, infrared. It's across. hard to hear you. Can you speak loud a little bit? So I was interested in modeling something uh, similar to infrared spectroscopy. So you know, infrared spectroscopy works uh, off the normal modes of the molecule. So uh, in the most simplistic settings, say you have like an H2 molecule that vibrates on one axis. So it's very easy to model this in one dimension. So uh, we all know the harmonic oscillator potential, uh, which I <coughs> generalized to be offset from zero. Uh, in reality, of course, you can have dissociation of molecules, so it's not truly the harmonic potential, it's an anharmonic potential, but I've shown that on the right, but I've ignored it and worked with simply the harmonic potential. Um, <clears throat> so to model the electric field, um, we've done the linear dipole approximation, um, and so that's shown on the top line there, where it's proportional to the charge, the offset, and uh, it oscillates in time, so I've attached the, uh, a cosine function to it with some driving frequency. Um, and I've reduced the amplitude of that, the Q and the, uh, the factor, to just A, the simplicity. Um, and of course, the electric field is proportional to the, the displacement, so we can rewrite the displacement in terms of raising and lowering operators just to kind of tie back to class a little bit. Um, so what is the overall Hamiltonian? Okay, it's just an addition of the kinetic energy, the harmonic oscillator, and the electric field. Okay, so what I did is I took different situations of driving frequencies. So I set the intrinsic harmonic oscillator potential uh, to a frequency of one. Again, this is a very generalized system as well. Um, so what I've done is I've taken the driving frequency fraction uh, with the intrinsic frequency. So you can see 0 0.3 is uh, 3 tenths of the uh, intrinsic frequency. Um, and so I've run that. Uh, and as you can see, there's a nice peak when the driving frequency is equal to the intrinsic frequency. And we call that resonance. Um, which is exactly how infrared spectroscopy works. Um, and as you get closer and closer to the resonant frequency, you can uh, a better transfer of energy from the electric field to the wave packet. That's kind of how you can interpret that. Um, or a more efficient absorption. Um, so visualize that. So here we have uh, an electric field frequency of non-intrinsic frequency of the harmonic oscillator. Um, and so you can see the energy absorption based upon the, the height of the wave packet on the, on the plot with respect to the bottom of the well is roughly constant. And so the absorption of energy from the electric field is minimal. And so now we run the same simulation uh, with or at the resonant frequency. So the scaling is kind of weird, but you can kind of see by the broadening of the uh, of the potential that the wave packet is traveling upward. Okay, so a, a good way to analyze this, uh, or the most simple way, I should say, is to take a look at the, if you, if you run it for a long time, you have sort of a maximal energy absorption, uh, so it's like a saturated uh, wave packet, then it kind of falls back down and restarts again, so it does this in waves, as you kind of saw in the very first plot. Um, so if you take the maximal energy and you plot it um, against uh, the driving frequency, or the, the frequency ratio in this case, um, you get this plot. And this coincides very nicely with the classical resonance theory, which simply dictates uh, that when these two are the same, you have a max. And that's pretty much okay, it. Okay, that's very good. Jim? On the, last, on the previous slide, with the results, there is this extra broadening of the experimental curve 
that is not there, right? By this well, point. yeah. I when I plotted the theoretical curve, I didn't take, I didn't do any calculations for the broadening of the peak. I just wanted to show that um, the peak will line up with classical treatment. So the broadening term is is here in this beta, which is related to the driving. But the point in the middle that is right on top of the theoretical, and then as you go down, there is this extra. It doesn't look Gaussian. It doesn't look. It. Oh well. It so looks very weird. All these points are very close together, so that's probably just some numerical error. Yeah, can I can I help? Sure. Yes. Short pulse. Mm -hmm. Duration of short pulse gives uncertainty in uh, energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is running simulation for a short period of time that contributes additional uh, broadening. It should be convincing to you. More quick, yes. Please. So if you ran it for a significant amount more time, it would be closer to the theoretical peak? Is that what you're saying? It would be less broadened if you ran it for longer? Mm -hmm. More questions? Yes, please. So you ignored your, uh, you were showing in the beginning two potentials, right? One is harmonic and that's one is unharmonic. And you were um, saying, no, oh, I will focus just on the harmonic one. So could you give a physical reason or just tell when unharmonicity in the system is not so important and why you can neglect unharmonicity? And is it really applicable for your case, for, 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 for your simulation? I mean, for real simulations which are shown on this black curve with experiment. Well, the main uh, result that would occur if I would have done the anharmonic is that the, the frequencies would be, of course, anharmonic or non-resonant, so it may not, so like <laughs> overtones may not occur at integer numbers as well. So that's, that's a nice result of anharmonic. So the, the energy spacings between the, the states are not uh, equal to space. Equal to, yeah, equal to space. But you didn't answer why we can ignore this effect. Why we still be considering the system harmonically. Because the attraction between the, I'm just assuming that the attraction between the two, uh, in this case H2, H molecules, uh, is non dissociative. And so it's like a, in the limit of small oscillations. So close to its ground state, in other words, yes. right? Okay, let's thank uh, Brennan. And the next uh, presenter is Andrew Olson, who uh, continues the single potential energy surface uh, description, but he will try to bring it closer to real world. So he will um, I present on, on this on this practical reaction. All right, so I'll talk about the combustion of rocket fuel specifically hydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide. So um, there's three main categories of rocket fuel. Um, essentially what you need to know from this slide is that these two require an um, initial energy to overcome the activation energy and hypergolic, which I am be focusing on, it does not require this says reacts on contact. Um, so yeah, hypergolic fuel, uh, it's spontaneous, like I just said. Uh, it's useful for really precise movement. So let's say you have a spaceship you want to land on the International Space Station. Because it's so like instant almost, the movement, it's really precise and you can land it and get those really precise movements of thrust. But the downfall is that it is toxic. So they only use it at the moment for unmanned spacecrafts. So there's three main types of hyper, hypergolic fuel. There's hydrazine, um, and then these two monomethyl hydrazine and unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine. The only difference is in place of an NH bond, they add a methyl group. Um, so when you add the two methyl groups, or the one or two methyl groups, the difference is that it lowers the freezing point, which is beneficial because uh, they wouldn't need as much heating supply if they bring it in, like if they store it in space. And then uh, it also, the downfall is that it lowers the specific impulse or the thrust. So this is a representation of the activation energies. So as you can see, the, the blue is the N, and the, a, or the white is the H. So the 
So the N to H breaks as it overcomes that first barrier. Then you can see it slowly shifts over to the OH. So this is, um, this green is the activation energy, and this is, this one is with zero initial momentum, and as you can see, it still overcomes the activation ener energy pretty easily. Um, like I said earlier, spontaneous. And then for this one, just to get a different perspective, I bumped the initial momentum up quite a bit, and again, it overcomes the activation energy pretty easily. And this is the uh, amount that goes to completion of the reaction. So as you can see, it jumps up pretty quickly, but it does get a little wavy, and I think that's due to uh, just MATLAB error, because it did bounce back off the side walls on the video, that you just saw. So yeah. Okay, let's thank you. Questions? Uh, can you go on the slides where you're showing two, comparing two, two wells? This yeah, one. this one. I didn't get, what exactly is the difference between your right and left? Uh, this has a higher initial momentum, and this has a zero initial momentum. So it just changes the initial momentum of your uh, of, of the wave packet, but the potential is exactly the same in both cases? Like your, your, your green curve is your activation energy, right? Yeah. So this activation energy is exactly the same. Yep. So it's affecting your overall... Potential in the same way. Okay. Exactly. More questions? Yeah. Could you go to that last probability slide? This one. Yeah. I guess I'm a little confused. You said that through this you determine that it like goes to completion. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Okay. So then what is it looks like it crosses over twice and potentially is like leading up to a third time. So like what does that represent in the actual reaction? Well, okay. Well you see this slide, like as it goes across like bounces back, and then it creates that wave that goes over this area again. So my idea that I got from this was that this like squiggly lines is just representation. It just represents MATLAB error. It's just kind of like, you know, it doesn't look quite as clean on that side. Okay, I guess I, if, if it's all right, I was asking more so, is this like an equilibrium almost, or it's going back and forth? I don't believe so. Okay. Wait, let me help. As soon as wave packet reaches the boundaries of the simulation box, results become untrustable. Okay. More questions to Andrew? <laughs> if not, thank you once again. <laughs> and the next presentation is by Hannah Tun, who will uh, continue our journey into the world of uh, real molecules and chemical reactions and she will tell about the uh, catalytic production of uh, hydrogen. Um, yeah, like Dimitri said, I'm going to talk about the catalytic production of a proton into hydrogen gas for fuel purposes. Um, before I talk about my reaction, I just want to talk about um, hydrogen as a fuel source and some of its advantages and disadvantages. Um, the reaction I've shown is the combustion of hydrogen gas with oxygen gas. And us chemists can clearly see a difference between most combustion reactions we think of, and that's that carbon dioxide is not produced. And that leads me to my first advantage, is that hydrogen fuel source is a clean source of fuel because it doesn't produce carbon dioxide like most fuel sources we traditionally use. Um, we have an abundance of hydrogen in our universe. It is the most abundant element in our universe. Um, hydrogen gas is a much more efficient source of fuel than what we traditionally use and it's much quieter than traditional combustion engines. Um, there are some disadvantages to using hydrogen as a fuel that it is highly flammable and has a tendency to ignite at very low temperatures. And it has very low viscosity, which basically means that it can leak very easily in a container through small cracks. And with the low viscosity, that also means it can fill up a room very quickly. So those two disadvantages can be a very bad combination. So strict safety procedures need to be followed when working with hydrogen. And I talked about there being an abundance of hydrogen, but um, hydrogen gas is very rarely found in the air because it's lighter than the air, so it's up above in our atmosphere. So instead of trying to obtain this hydrogen gas somehow, we can create it, and that leads me to my experiment. Um, so I focused on the reduction of a proton into molecular hydrogen using a platinum catalyst, and this is the reaction right here. 
that I used. Um, and um, what is formed, the intermediate of the platinum phthalos is this platinum cluster here. And actually, like you can see it right here, and it's centered with one platinum, and then platinum's all on the sides, and hydrogen's formed on the outside. And heat is used to cleave the hydrogens from this platinum cluster. And I think it was about 2,000 Kelvin it needed to be. And you can see here, like the hydrogens are starting to get closer together, and then after time, they start to dissociate from the platinum catalyst. And um, this catalyst is a heterogeneous catalyst, just meaning that it's in a different state than the molecule that it's catalyzing. And so my first um, challenge was just modeling this in MATLAB, the activation energy. And I did this based off data provided to me by Dr. Hahn. Um, he had only provided me with 17 points of data, so I actually interpolated it into 97 points. And this here you can see is the activation energy for the breaking of the platinum hydrogen bond. And, um, I used the wave packet code in MATLAB for this, and um, one of the major changes I made was it was set up for that of an electron, and the mass was just one, and so I changed it to about eight, 1837 because the mass of a proton is about that much more than that times the mass of an electron. Um, and then I ran this code at various momentum. I had a hard time getting it to look nice with positive momentum values, so um, the videos I'm going to show are all with negative momentum values. So this first video just kind of shows the reaction not proceeding, nothing's really happening because the momentum is too low or not low enough because I'm using negative values. And then that was about negative six, the one where it didn't really go. And then this is about um, a negative 12. And it kind of just starts to go over and then goes back and kind of does some weird stuff. Um, but then the lower or higher, more negative I made it, um, this just started to be higher in general, almost above it, so then it's definitely going to go. Um, and you can see it just definitely goes over now because the momentum is much higher. And yeah, that is all I have. Okay, good. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Floor is open for discussion. Yeah. So in, in, in your slide was your Simulations you have uh, again green, yellowish kind of, and red. So for the red, what is the difference between red and yellowish? Because they look pretty much the same, with the difference only that one is a little bit offset. Um, yeah. So I know the green is the activation energy, and I'm pretty sure this is this yellow is just the energy of the proton trying to go over the activation energy, and the red, if I'm correct, is probability of the position. Of the, 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 the same as with the. Um... It is the same story as the question that was asked to the speaker number two. Ah, a different method for your Hamiltonian, right? Yeah. Your momentum. Yeah. But what is your red and uh, yellow? Sh you, you said it's energy? Um, if I'm correct, yeah, this is like the energy of my reaction with proton. Because I'm just looking at the proton, or two protons, actually. Because? You want to say that uh, your probability distribution is offset vertically according to total energy, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not energy. Uh, I mean, it's a distribution of your uh, of the position of your wave packet, right? It's completely different, observable. Yes. <laughs> okay. Question. Uh, we didn't like study catalysts that much in this class, but is there any reason you chose platinum instead of another catalyst? Um, yeah, other metal catalysts could have been used, but um, <laughs> I was just provided with research papers from Dr. Han and oh, other yeah. people that where they used a platinum catalyst, and that's where I got some of my figures and my data was from. So okay, yeah. Okay, let's thank Hannah once again. And uh, next presenter is uh, Beth Padol, who is real. Uh, Tell about quantum aspects <laughs> of the fragmentation of metal organic complexes. Yeah, so as I said, I'm looking at the fragmentation of metal organic com complexes. Um, there we go. Okay, so our fragmentation of any molecule um, occurs when the, the molecule gains enough activation energy to surpass the barrier. Um, so this energy can be found in any sorts of methods. Um, it could be thermal activation, photon activation, or um, the energy from a laser, which is what we're looking at today. Um, so 
hopefully this video loads. So this is our um, lanthanide mo uh, molecule. So as you can see, the bonds are being broken. It's not to pass in the second barrier, so they're being um, reformed as a ghost. Um, and then this is just the general activation um, diagram. So as it passes the barrier, it gains enough energy to pass the barrier, then it can move into the excited state and then back into the ground state. So lanthanide cyclopentyldiamide um, is, uh, so a little background on it, it's highly volatile. Um, and because of this, it can be used to create films for prote protective coatings at relatively um, low temperatures. Um, and with that, we can use our laser to excite the LACP into this um, excited state so that it can form these, these coatings. Um, so my goal with the MATLAB uh, research was to show this, this molecule um, reaching its excited state, passing the barriers, um, and then um, at a certain momentum, I should be able to show that um, it'll pass through both barriers and the bond will be broken. Um, I ran into some problems initially with this. Um, so my, my data that was given, um, I had again about 20 points. Um, so we tried to just do, use this data as, as was shown, um, but as you can see, it just kind of tunnels through the first barrier at any momentum. So these, um, these momentums are all the same momentums. We're just showing a different um, starting, on the, or starting location. Um, so we tried using um, like starting it in the middle and seeing if it would pass any barrier then. We started tried go, starting at the end and proceeding backwards. And the same thing happened, it just tunneled through. Um, so to solve that problem, um, we interpolated more points. Um, we went up to 390 points um, using the MATLAB code. And then we also reflected the barrier so that we could see both the forward and backward. Uh, maybe both the forward and backward views of this. So these videos are going to be showing um, the momentum going. This one is an initial momentum momentum of seventy five um, thousand, and then that was a hundred thousand. Um, so as you can see, it is sort starting to pass um, through the first barrier here. Um, the one on the right is passing through a little bit more, and it's almost reaching the second barrier. Um, so we did come to more, uh, more excitable, excitable conclusions with this one. Um, we were just able to see the actual process being carried out once we saw both sides. Um, so our conclusions. Um, the bond reached excited, this excited state to pass through the first barrier fairly easily. Um, the second barrier was a bigger challenge. Um, the visualizations show that there was not enough energy to pass through that remaining barrier, um, so it was converted back into a bond, um, and it proceeded in the reverse direction. Okay, but then, but... <laughs> Any questions? Please. For your molecule, I didn't get you breaking CC bond or CH bond. Like what? What uh, we're breaking up the carbon. Or or you breaking the bond between metal and carbon? Yeah. So yeah, it means. Yeah, we're breaking which bond the, is broken. We're breaking the bond between the metal and the carbon. So ah, okay. Like so then when you say like going through first barrier, it means you broke one bond. Going yeah. through the second barrier, you you require the second bond is broken. Right. Yeah, it so it's kind of like the, the to get the, through the second barrier, um, it it still has pull from the from the central ion, um, so the the carbon is still like in the circle of the of the attraction between um, the metal and the carbon, and then to re break the second barrier, then it would actually release the carbon. So breaking through the first bond, the bond, the carbon is still in the system, and then if you broke the second bond, then it would actually be able to be a free carbon atom. I see. One, two, three. Well, thank you. Best once again. So, last but not least, presentation is by Luke Willen, and uh, uh, he will conclude our journey into world of real reactions in uh, giving some comments on possibility of connecting atoms. So, uh, polymerization reaction. What is yours? All right, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I did my project on the photopolymerization of uh, cyclohexacyline. Um, cyclohexacyline is just a six-member ring of silines, so SI6H3. 
Well, um, and it's not going. Um, so what's important about this is that um, it's one of the initial steps in order to create crystalline silicon. Crystalline silicon is important because um, this is a very important uh, material that we can make into a semiconducting a semiconductor and has um, applications in photo photovoltaics and ultimately solar cells. Um, so the main point of my, um, can't really see it, but the main point of what I wanted to figure out is this SI-SI bond on the cyclohexacylene um, is broken by UV light. Um, so I wanted, um, the purpose of my research was to figure out how much energy it took to break that and how dependent <laughs> it was on the initial kinetic energy of the system. And I predict that because this is um, a surprisingly very little bond difference between polycylene, polycylene and cyclohexacylene, it's less than like 20 kilojoules per mole difference. I feel like the activation energy is going to, or not the activation energy, the kinetic energy um, required to excite that electron, break it apart, and form, start forming the polymer is going to be very small, and it's going to tail off really quickly. So it's going to be a very small window, and initial kinetic energy won't have the greatest um, effect past that initial state. So um, to start out, use obviously MATLAB. Um, what I went for with um, the code wise, so um, represents the Hamiltonian operator for a charge transfer, transfer potentials. And with mine, um, my potentials, I use a Morse potential to try and um, graph the, uh, so you have the well that, it's, yeah, and it goes to, uh, that basically I wanted to um, be able to um, try to show the bond as it's, um, bound and unbound. You'll see once I get to the next slide here. Um, so here's my um, program that I ran. The, uh, this kind of tan line is the um, ground state of the electron within the polys, uh, the cyclohexacylene. And then this uh, light green Morse potential doesn't really look like one, but then eventually goes off and does approach the uh, initial zero potential line. Um, and then you'll see here a yellow line that represents the initial state of the wave packet distribu distribution. And the blue line will be the ground state of the electron distribution. And the red line, you can't really see it right now, you'll see it here, it's a video. Um, but you'll see the blue line transition into a red line, and that represents the excited state of the electron. There. So you see the blue line eventually die down, all of it goes into the excited state of the yeah. All right, and so my results. Um, my initial momentum chose for P naught was 23 to 31. This is kind of a small window, so it's some of my predictions are starting to show through a little bit. Reason I chose these is because it gave me a, a reaction yield from 9% to 97%. Anything lower or higher than that just kind of started approaching about 95% at actually, yeah, and then about 5%. Um, so, then we, I plotted the uh, different, um, different initial momentums. So the darker the line, the higher the momentum. And this is the probability of the reaction to go through, where one being a complete spontaneous reaction and zero, which is down here being the reaction did not go through. You can obviously see as we increased um, initial kinetic energy, the reaction had a greater and greater probability of going through completion. And then I took the initial kinetic energy and I plotted it against the rate reaction, which I differentiated from these values. We actually see a nice little curve here. So what we're looking at is over as we increase kinetic energy, we see that the rate initially increases for a short amount of time. We're looking on the scale of less than a less than a power. And eventually does start trailing off, and it eventually um, the Slope will approach zero on that. So, so it is starting to show results that are very similar to my predictions. So, oh, oh, there we go. so in conclusion, um, we saw the small window of kinetic energy that the product needed 
to cause the reaction to go to spontane spontaneity as predicted. We saw how the effect of the initial kinetic energy had, uh, had an immediate effect on the rate of reaction, initially growing quickly, and then trailing off as the kinetic energy um, continued to increase. And then moving forward with, forward with this information, um, we can use this to begin modeling the uh, rest of the um, rest of the reactions to create eventually crystalline silicon, which can then be used to better understand it, how to create it, because this is a very important material. And thank you. Okay. <laughs> Everyone is tired? Yes, please. It's the very beginning. I'm a little bit confused. So you have your picture showing how you start with a cyclosilane ring runs and you uh, break the bonds there and then you uh, kind of creating the crystal from, mm -hmm. from, from uh, polymers, right. for, for, for silicon polymers. So what exactly, which of these processes is um, connected to this simulation? Um, right so, here. So, so we the first one? Yep, the cyclohexosilane being excited by UV light, which, so two of the silicons will break and they both have one electron since it was just a regular bond. Um, and these now to be a radical can now um, react with the neighboring also breaking up cyclohexosilanes, forming um, silane polymers now. See here, this is what it, the end breaks up and then the neighboring um, cycle. But these processes are not really involved in this simulation anymore, right? Your simulation is stopped there. Right, yes. As as it doesn't know, involve like, the coming the together, board. it's this the breaking really apart so it can, the next part is spon spontaneous, so okay. Okay. assumed to be spontaneous. Questions one, questions two, questions three. Let's thank Luke once again. <laughs> so, concluding remarks. Uh, I give a brief because some of you have uh, other uh, things on the new schedule. So, many thanks for investing your time into a physical chemistry course. I have about four points to, to mention. First, if you are filling the feedback charts, please return them to me. Second, all participants of these presentations will not regret. The amount of accumulated credit will make you happy, even if something went not perfectly. So, you, you will be satisfied. Third, in the course, you got two or three types of major experience and skills. So fundamental knowledge in the uh, basics of physical chemistry and quantum theory, exposure to simplified by but more or less realistic research style and scientific communications. This will give you benefits if you enter in next course on the on this track. So if you are uh, entering inorganic chemistry, physical chemistry too, or um, computational chemistry, it will make your life in those courses much easier. And if you ever decide to continue on the research pathway, the exposure to research style and scientific communications will help you to excel there. With this, I would like to thank you all, to thank all speakers for presenting and uh, visitors to support the discussion. <laughs> With this, all meetings of the Chem 364 are done. Finished. Class is dismissed. That is a great feeling. <laughs> I feel like you should have had that yeah. class over. I like, just said PowerPoint right away. Slide. I was going to say, you should have had class and lecture. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty cool. Are you going to the machines? Yes, it's yeah. in 20 minutes. I thought there was not enough question time prepared to ask you questions. <laughs> Did you tell me we had this? Uh, we got Amy sent out an email. Um, That's all I knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to the whole department. Huh? Is that all just in class research, or did you? Is it one of your like research projects that you just like threw into a class presentation? Everything was yeah. it was all brand new stuff. Oh, yeah, sorry.
Can I shoot you an email? Um, yes. I'm going to talk to HR today. Okay. I should get those forms and everything in. Can I just email you? And I will see. Wait, 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 Yep. Um, uh, besides that, though, can you just email me where that desk is going to be? Okay. Um, I'm seeing they were referring to your, to your uh, yeah. potentials. Mm -hmm. um, can you show Austin uh, the office? Yeah. He's interested to do some research. Okay. And he's, he needs a place to sit. Okay. Yeah, cool. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks. Да, вот какие-то его имя. Это тот человек, у которого потенциал не забрали. Надо было сразу его представить. Слушай, я подумала, у тебя на самом деле было что-то, ну, я думаю, у тебя получалось что-то похожее, что я хотела тебе сказать. Но можно это сделать немножко более, так сказать, смотри, все равно есть студенты, которые у тебя как бы отказывались. Красивые цветы, только чужие или там. Вот или в другом. Я торопился, поэтому взял готовый букет. Давай этот букет никому не отдадим. Мы это никому не дадим, все дома. А это подарим кому-нибудь. Эми или Тимоне, кому там. Кому нам хочется. Подари. Так я хотела что-то сказать так. Это коробочка? Да. А, ты в ней все можно нести. Классно. Как ты цветы будешь нести? Все в коробку. В одном или в две? В одном. Сейчас запись идет, я не знаю, как ее остановить. Она записывающая. Да, она записывает. И непонятно, здесь нет этих кнопочек. Раньше были одни кнопочки, сейчас другие. Рекорд без микрофиса. Я боюсь просто, что если я просто, просто отключу, то оно сотрется. Я присылал вам, да, так сапотин Тим, они тоже студенты. Федочка, ты мне дала свою эту писала, кому какие оценки или нет, просто. Да. Ну, есть такие, у которых сплошные H. А, ну, а, вот а, сразу а. после C особенно было на контрасте. <laughs> то, есть, то есть сначала выступили два очень слабых студента, да? Я не знаю, по какой причине, но слабые студенты выбрали либо начало, либо конец, а сильные были в середине. Да, вот сразу после слабых очень, очень круто был D2, или даже три. Вот розовый мне очень понравился. Он вроде так не очень уверенно отвечал, именно, ну там некоторые просто брали харизму, ну видно было, что он сразу вышел и уже все, ему уже хочется эй поставить. Вот. А был парень вот в розовой рубашке, который здесь вот где-то спереди сидел, я не помню, ну я могу, я не помню, что он там. Просто на фотографии На фотографии так я не скажу. На фотографии он без розовой рубашки. Спасибо большое, что вы пришли. Это выглядит, что звук еще не идет, но... I fear to to push anything to that it will not be recorded. Yeah, it's a and in progress. Angela was able to run it for me, but when I'm trying to do it, it asks for uh, system administrator password or something like. Okay. Not the way I expected to function. So the goal is just to keep this recording on the podium and convert it away. Yeah, if, there, sure if, if, if there was a report. I think so. Let's see. Create all this with this. But until the recording, see, see these numbers? Is it for connection? Uh, or for, for, for security? No, that looks like a security one. So we are on, on uh, air. We are recorded now. And it will not stop, it will not process the file until it is formally finished. I believe so. Let me see what's here. Yeah, this is there's something now. Let's stop here.
Впечатление, что мы дадим их после того, как мы собираемся стол, чтобы больше сидеть. Чем больше? Переносить свои подкладывания. Did you pause the recording at any point? I did not. Okay. Usually I think this time comes up when you pause it. No, it was on uh, every day. Oh, it's always there? Yes. Okay. And it's still running. Um, it still keeps going out. I, I, I think if, if, if I close, or I don't want to do it, but mm. if I would close this, it would, uh, it would accept it as a command to stop recording, and maybe it will start recording. But oh, this uh, is I, just, yeah, this is just the site where, where the recording, like the access to the server. Mm -hmm. It's really the software on the PC, and I'm not sure if it's actually, it says it's still running, let's see. It's not listed as an action. It's maybe some weapon. Maybe a recorder right here. So it looks like it is still running but without the taskbar. And uh, I noticed it on, in other classroom as well, uh, in, in the EML, mm -hmm. task bar stopped to pop up. How oh, weird. And then it uh, asks whether I want to download and reinstall uh, Tegrity Reporter. Okay. And then uh, it doesn't accept my password and tells that it should be a system manager. Yeah, if you go, if you go directly to the Tegrity site here, it will want a password, a Tegrity specific password. Mm -hmm. Where the way you send in, you go to Blackboard, yes. and you authenticate through Blackboard, and that should work for you. But what I'm doing right now, here for example, this is the Tegrity specific password. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to stop it. Um, It's really odd. So we link two recordings at the same time. I think the recording is running normally and everything is fine, other than that the taskbar yes. malfunctioned and, and disappeared. And so I'm just trying to figure out how to stop this recording without. Um, losing it because it would just restart the computer it would stop the recording but at that point I don't know if it would actually then finish it and upload it or if it would somehow corrupt it would erase everything and consider yeah. this empty file I'll, I'll play with this well and thank you thank you so much yeah I'll try to figure out what's going on Thank you. Well, I hope very, I hope a lot. I trust that you will succeed. Yeah, I'll I'll work on it. I'll make sure to, to get it done somehow. Okay. Many thanks for continuous hope. Oh absolutely, you're welcome.
Hey, um, I got a question for you. Do you have a minute? Yeah, sure. And maybe it's for Trevor too. I don't know if either one of you guys have um, run into this. So there's a Tegrity recording running up here in 422. And it appears that it's still running. Everything seems fine, except that the, the, the little tray that you usually have in the, in the taskbar is gone. So there's no way for me to stop the recording. So I'm trying to figure out how to stop this. I don't want to just force this application to close or restart or something because I'm worried that I'm going to lose the recording. Right. Have you have you seen? I've heard of this before, but I've never actively been in the room trying to stop it. I've heard that it disappeared and people would usually just restart, but I can't remember if they then lost it or if it somehow was still saved. I can change the display settings and go back and forth a little bit. Maybe they'll do something. Okay. Let's see. It's up to you if you have time.